I hope that you've been following the series so far. Acts is really a novel. It's a piece of literature. It's written like a piece of literature. It's a story. You know, we suffer uh, from having chapters and verses in our Bibles. They kind of restrict us and constrain us, so we look at bits and pieces of the Scriptures, and we miss the overarching narrative. And so I recommend to you that you read the whole of Acts in one sitting. It's 28 chapters, very, very small for a novel, and very easily accessible. Or even better, do what I do. Well, if you've got a motorbike, I travel to work and I listen to it read out. And listening to the Bible read out is actually really useful because, again, you don't get stuck on the things that you recognize in the text. You know, one's eyes are drawn to things, oh, I know that bit. And so you kind of skip over it and miss the opportunity for God to say something fresh to us. So I recommend that. And the story of Acts, of course, is the story of the birth of the early church. And it's a continuation from Luke's gospel. They're kind of one and the same thing. As Paul mentioned this morning, Luke wrote Acts as the story of what Jesus continued to do and to teach through the apostles and through the early church. And it's kind of like a perpetual motion engine. And really, Acts should be called Acts of the Holy Spirit, because it's the Holy Spirit behind everything that goes on. He's behind breaking people out of jail. He's behind healings. He's behind all sorts of things. He's behind giving people the guts and determination to push ahead when they're being persecuted. Luke is trying to show us the difference between two groups of people. On the one hand, you've got a group of people who are absolutely committed to having their lives transformed. They're connected with Jesus and they're following him, whatever the cost. And there are other people who turn up in the story who want the benefits of that, but they don't really want the commitment. And I find that fascinating. You can see it there if you look for it so often in the text. That kind of idea manifests itself at least twice in chapter 5. So let's quickly read chapter 5 together. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you do such a thing? You have not lied to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats, so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, 
were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts that they'd been told and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and all the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We're witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Theudas appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and all his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it's from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. I couldn't possibly do justice to that in a short time today. And the first four chapters of Acts I like the beginning of a story where everything goes right. The apostles get baptized in the Holy Spirit. They declare the good news about Jesus, about his death and resurrection to all the people in Jerusalem. Peter became transformed from someone who was a coward and fearful into an incredibly bold and powerful public speaker. God demonstrates his support for what's going on by performing incredible miracles. The fellowship of the believers grows daily in number. Those who saw it but didn't join were favorably disposed to the early church, with the obvious exception of the religious authorities who didn't care much for what was going on. And they threatened Peter and John, stuck them in a local prison and made verbal threats, but nothing more than that at that time. And that simply made Peter and John bolder. And then we get to Acts 5. 
the preacher's hospital pass. And a pricey of chapter 5, if you were coming to it the first time, could read to some as simply as, that couple didn't give us all the money and now they're dead. And at first glance, it's quite a peculiar story, isn't it? At the start of the book, Luke infers that he's telling us about the continuing story of Jesus. And perhaps if you and I were compiling Acts, we would have thought twice about including this one. We probably, if we were Luke's literary agent, have said to him, don't put that in there. That's going to put people off. They're going to freak out when they, hear, when they read that. They're going to think, these people are weird. People are dying. But fortunately for us, the Holy Spirit was Luke's literary agent. And so his approach in both the gospel and in Acts is to weave together a story made from components that actually happened. And just as in real life, there's embarrassing stuff. Just as there is in your life and mine, there's embarrassing stuff. But it's a story of redemption, ultimately. It's a story about how the gospel rescues people. Luke is interested in relaying what actually happened. The first thing that happens, of course, is after Ananias and Sapphira died, people got really freaked out. People in the church got freaked out. People outside heard about it very quickly. These kind of stories, they go around like wildfire. These days on social media, five minutes after something happens and whoosh, it's everywhere. In this kind of society, everybody knows everyone else. This story would have got around very quickly. Luke makes an interesting observation. What happened didn't prevent the gospel from continuing to be preached and changing lives. Actually, quite the opposite. We might think something like this, you know, it's going to put people off, but it doesn't. Luke says, day after day, people came. Even though they were afraid, they heard the gospel and they joined the believers. The apostles simply didn't water the gospel down for anyone. And that's really interesting. There is often in the church great pressure that it's necessary to conform to the society around us. What happens first when we start doing that as church is that the gospel begins to get diluted. The bits that we think might feel uncomfortable for people to hear start to pass them out of the story. But that's where the gold is. That's where the power of the gospel is. The apostles didn't dilute the gospel for a minute. They didn't excuse the gospel. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Luke makes an interesting observation about what happened through the apostles, and Peter in particular. Symbolism has always played a massive part in church life, and we shouldn't be afraid of it. We find stories in Acts where odd things happen. People get healed with handkerchiefs, aprons. Peter's shadow falls on them. God isn't frightened of weird. We celebrate God's ability to break through anything and everything, all cultural norms. All that weird stuff with Paul and his handkerchief and Peter in his shadow, maybe that had something to do with what Jesus meant when he said, you'll do greater things than I have done. Now, the bulk of chapter 5, most of the verses tell us of how the persecution of the church began in earnest. They really started to get going on the apostles. They start to punish them. It mentions being flogged. Being flogged in those days meant being whipped with a cat of nine tails, a kind of whip with several leather thongs on it, at the end of which were either a bit of bone or a bit of glass. And being struck with something like that was no joke. So it's remarkable that the apostles rejoiced that they were counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. What an incredible thing. Can't begin to imagine the courage that that requires. It's also amazing how the religious authorities completely overlook the Ten Commandments in their desire to murder the apostles. The Sixth Commandment says, do not murder. But it's convenient for them to forget that at the time. They're trying to defend the law. They're trying to defend the traditions. Since that time, the church has been persecuted church has never been without persecution. And persecution comes in all sorts of forms, doesn't it? 
It's interesting that later in Acts, Paul warns the Ephesian church that persecution will come from inside. Persecution doesn't just come from outside the church, it can come from inside too. And in parts of the world right now, Christians are being persecuted for their faith. That stand there that we set up with prayer for the nations, it's quite shocking to read some of the stories from around the world about how Christians are struggling to maintain their faith in the teeth of extreme persecution. But what about in the UK? We're certainly going to suffer persecution as well, probably of a different kind. We probably are not going to, in the immediate future, be persecuted physically. But a time is coming when the law and our culture will take a very dim view on what it means to be a Christian. We're already finding that now. Laws being drafted in which the gospel would be considered offensive. And how are we going to deal with that? Will I hold my ground? Will you? I'm going to turn now to Ananias and Sapphira, but I think, you know, just drawing on this idea that Acts is a continual story and we shouldn't really get bogged down in chapters and verses, we need to understand the context in which that story of Ananias and Sapphira is set. Luke spells the context out for us twice in chapters 2 and 4. He says, they devoted themselves, this is the early believers, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and signs were performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And then in chapter 4, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had with great power, The apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there were no needy persons among them. From from time to time, those who owned land and houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. And Luke uses the word devoted here. And that means intention and persistence. It means complete commitment without compromise. And notice how Luke makes a solid link between the believer's attitude towards their personal possessions and their property and the unity that was experienced among them. Notice how these things are also strongly linked to growth in the church, both in numbers and quality of faith. Now, this is the background to the story of Ananias and Sapphira. It's a story of contrast between those who are devoted and those who are merely involved. And it was a different time and it was a different culture. But I think we need to be aware of two equal and opposite risks when we read these stories in Acts 2 and 4 about how the believers were all together in one heart and mind. And the first is that we take it too literally. We say, right, what we've got to do is sell everything and join a Christian commune. And that's the right answer. The second is that we don't take it literally enough. And we make excuses for failing to put our property and possessions at God's disposal. And it's easy to do in theory and it's much harder to do in practice. These kind of things are very tempting to wave away. Say, well, it was culturally, that's how they did things at the time. No, no, no. God places a demand on us that includes all of our lives, everything. Not just your soul, your heart, your mind. Your money and your possessions are his as well. And Ananias and Sapphira is a salutary tale. I think it poses a simple question to us. Are we playing a religious game? Is that what church is? And it places a simple truth before us too that God places a higher value on the gospel than he does on our individual lives. There are several stories in scripture of God taking people out. And we first learn that Ananias and Sapphira 
collude together in a conceit to withhold money. Now, legally, they were perfectly within their rights to do that. It was their property. They weren't breaking the law by withholding money, but they were conflicted. It's clear that they knew what was expected of them because everybody else was putting all of the proceeds from the sales at the apostles' feet. And they lied when they were questioned. Putting things at the apostles' feet is a little bit like an equivalent to the Old Testament burnt offering. When you did a burnt offering as a Jew, you were relinquishing your ability to utilize that thing you were offering. It was burnt. It was gone. It was no longer yours to control. And I think similarly we have this here. When people place the proceeds from sale of their property completely at the apostles' feet, it's like a burnt offering. They're saying, I'm no longer in control of this. This is no longer my right to use. And we get the impression that Ananias and Sapphira were very private people. They don't appear to have discussed their concerns with anyone else. Perhaps nobody was speaking into their lives. They were solitary. And that's a dangerous situation to be in because it's very easy to reinforce one another's folly. Self-deception is a wonderful thing because we don't know that we're being deceived. We need others to speak into our lives. Peter is given the insight through the Holy Spirit and sees Satan at work. So their self-deception was helped along by Satan, but they weren't aware of it. And it's quite possible that the root of their action was fear, a fear that if they relinquished everything, they wouldn't have control over their future. I know I've felt like that. I still do from time to time. What if I give everything up, God? What if I say, you can have this? What if I let go of it? I'm putting my faith in God completely and saying, I relinquish control over my future. Perhaps they had a fear that God wouldn't provide for them. Maybe a fear that the quality of their life, the quality of life they really wanted, wouldn't be available to them if they gave it all up. Maybe they wanted a way out in case this Jesus thing just didn't work out for them. And I think that many of these kind of fears stalk at the edges of our minds. These are common fears. They're challenges continually for us to relinquish everything to God. I'll tell you a brief story about some friends of mine who it transpired had embezzled funds from the church. The way they had done that is they were kind of dipping into the pot a little bit here, a little bit there, and they justified it as a kind of loan. They didn't tell anyone. They justified it. They thought, well, we'll pay it back eventually. And it was discovered, and the whole thing blew up. It was at that point that they realized what they'd done was wrong. And that's fascinating, isn't it? that we can do things that we just excuse. We kind of continually excuse ourselves. And as we carry on that path, and it's secret and no one else knows about it, it grows into a thing, a very ungodly thing. They were self-deceived. Ananias and Sapphira were self-deceived. And they persisted by attempting to deceive Peter. But of course, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. Ananias and Sapphira's integrity was fractured. Their fragile attempt to live a double life was exposed. And they paid a very heavy price for it. Now, there's no medical explanation for what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. The scripture's silent about that. Nor any excuse offered. It doesn't say that God killed them. It's quite possible that... Ananias was so shocked at this revelation that he died of a heart attack. The Holy Spirit wants us to understand that there are consequences to our actions. And God sees what we do. It doesn't suggest that they lost their salvation. And the kingdom of God and the honor of the gospel are far more important than anyone's individual life. Theirs, yours, mine, the gospel will continue. The result of the story of Ananias and Sapphira was that the gospel got a shot in the arm. It would be an interesting exercise to think what would have happened if their actions were excused, if it was just covered up 
said, well, it's okay. You know, we'll forget about it. Quite clearly, the Holy Spirit wasn't up for that. But I've got some questions for you to discuss. How can we protect ourselves from self-deception? Has God ever demanded a sacrifice from you that you struggle to accept? And why is there relatively little healing in the church? 